Emperor admitted that he had during this conversation seriously and repeatedly offended Sir Hudson Lowe. And he also did him the justice to acknowledge that Sir Hudson Lowe had not precisely shown in a single instance any want of respect. He had contented himself with muttering between his teeth sentences which were not audible. He once said that he had solicited his recall and the emperor observed that that was the most agreeable word he could possibly have said. He also said that we endeavored to blacken his character in Europe, but that our conduct in that respect was a matter of difference to him. The only failure, perhaps, of the emperor on the part of the governor, and which was trifling compared with the treatment he had received, was the abrupt way in which he retired while the admiral withdrew slowly and with numerous salutes. The admiral was precisely then, observed the emperor in a gay tone of voice, what the Marquis de Gallo was at the time of my rupture of Passeriano. In allusion to one of the chapters of the campaign of Italy, which he had dictated to me, the emperor remarked that after all, he had to reproach himself with that scene. I must see this officer no more. He makes me fly into a violent passion. It is beneath my dignity. Expressions escape me, which would have been unpardonable at the Tuileries. If they can at all be excused here, it is because I am in his hands and subject to his power. After dinner, the emperor caused a letter to be read in answer to the governor who had officially sent the treaty the 2nd of August by which the Allied sovereign stipulated for the imprisonment of Napoleon, Sir Hudson Lowe, by the same conveyance. Asked to introduce the foreign commissioners to log with the emperor had, in the course of the day, dictated the letter to Monsieur de Monsalon. It was his wish that every one of us should propose his objections and state his opinions. It seemed to us a masterpiece of dignity and energy and sound reasoning. The 19th. The weather continued as dreadful as we had ever seen, and it had been for several days like one of our equinoctial storms in Europe. The emperor exposed himself to it to come to my apartment about 10 o'clock and going out. He struck one of his legs against the nail near the door. His stocking was torn halfway down his leg. Happily, the skin was only scratched. He was obliged to return to change. You owe me a pair of stockings, he said, while his valet de chambre was putting on another pair. A polite man does not expose his visitors to such dangers in his apartments. You are lodged too much like a seaman. It is true. That is not your fault. I thought myself careless about these matters, but you actually surpassed me. Sire, I answered, my merit is not great. No choice is left me. I am truly a hog and it's mire. I must confess. But as your majesty says, it's not altogether my fault. We went into the garden. When it had cleared up for a moment, the emperor reverted to the conversation which he had yesterday with the governor in the admiral's presence and again reproached himself with the violence of his expressions. It would have been more worthy of me, more consistent and more dignified to have expressed all these things with perfect composure. They would besides have been more impressive. He recollected in particular a name which had escaped him against Monsieur Lowe, scribe a top measure which must have shocked him the more so because it described the truth and that we know is always offensive. I have myself said the ever experienced that feeling in the island of Elba when I ran over the most infamous libels. They did not affect me in the slightest manner. When I was told to read that I had strangled, poisoned, ravaged, that I had massacred my sick, that my carriage had been driven over my wounded, I laughed out of commiseration. How often did I not then to say to Madame, make haste my mother, come and see the savage, the man tiger, the devourer of the human race, come and admire the fruit of your womb. But... When there was a slight reproach to truth, the effect was no longer the same. I felt a necessity defending myself. I accumulated reasons for my justification, even then it never happened. That I was left with that some traces of a secret torment. Medulla's causes, this is man. The emperor passed from this subject to his protestation against the treaty the 2nd of August, which had been read to us after dinner. I presume to ask him whether, after noticing in a conspicuous manner the acknowledgement of his title of emperor by the English during their negotiations at Paris to Chatillon, he had not forgotten that which they must have made of the Treaty of Fontainebleau, and which it struck me was omitted. It was, he quickly replied, dead of purpose. I have nothing to do with that treaty. I disclaim it. I am far from boasting of it. I am rather ashamed of it. It was discussed for me. I was betrayed by N, 
who brought it to me. If I had been then willing to treat with common sense, I should have obtained the kingdom of Italy, Tuscany, or Corsica, all that I could have desired. My decision was a result of a fault inherited in my character, a caprice on my part, a real constitutional excess. I was seized with a dislike and contempt of everything around me. I was affected with the same feeling for fortune, which I took a delight in outfacing. I cast my eye on a spot of land where I might be uncomfortable and take advantage of the mistake that might be made. I fixed upon the island of Elba. It was the act of a soul of rock. I have no doubt my dealer's cause is of a very singular disposition, but we should not be extraordinary. We were we not of a peculiar mold. I am a piece of rock launched into space you will not perhaps easily believe me but i do not regret my grandeur you see me slightly affected by what i have lost and why sire i observe should i not believe you what have you to regret the life of man is but an atom in the duration of history but with regard to your majesty the one is already so full that you scarcely ought to take any interest but in the other if your body suffers here your memory is enriched a hundredfold had it been your lot to end your days in the bosom of uninterrupted prosperity how many grand and striking circumstances would have passed away unknown you yourself sire have assured me of this and i have remained impressed with the force of that truth not a day in fact passes in which those who were your enemies do not repeat with us who are your faithful servants that you are unquestionably greater here than in the tuileries and even on this rock to which you have been transplanted by violence and perfidy do you not still command your jailers your masters at your feet your soul captivates everyone that comes near you you show yourself a history represents saint louis and the chains of the saracens the real master of his conquerors your irresistible ascendancy accompanies you here we who are all about you, sire, entertain this opinion of you. The Russian commissioner expressed the same sentiment. We are assured the other day, and it fell by one of those who guard you. What have you to regret? On our return, the emperor, in spite of the storm, ordered his breakfast in the tent and kept me with him. The water did not penetrate. The only inconvenience was a considerable degree of moisture. But the squalls of wind and rain whirled around us and vented themselves far before us towards the bottom of the valley. The spectacle was not destitute of beauty. The emperor retired about two o'clock, sent for me some time afterwards to his cabinet. I have, said he, laying down the book, just read General S., He's a madman, a harebrained fellow. He writes nonsense. He is, however, after all, readable and amusing. He cuts up the sax judges and pronounces sentence upon men and things. He does not hesitate to give advice in several instances to Wellington and his sir said he ought to have made some campaigns under Clever. Clever was no doubt a great general, but the notice taken of Sewell is not precisely the best part of the book. He is much better as an excellent director as a good war minister this s he continued deserted from the camp at boulogne with all my secrets to the english it might have been attended with serious consequences s was a general officer whose conduct was dreadful and unpardonable but observe how a man in the moment of revolution may be a bad character impudent shameless i found him on my return from the island of elba he waited for me with confidence and wrote a long letter in which he attempted to make me his dupe the English, he said, were miserable creatures. He had been a long time among them. He was acquainted with their means and resources and could be very useful to me. He knew that I was too magnanimous, too great to remember the wrongs I had suffered from him. I ordered him to be arrested. And as he had been already tried and condemned, I am at a loss to know why he was not shot. Either there was not time to carry a sense into fact, or he was forgotten. There can be no forbearance, no indulgence for the general, who has the infamy to prostitute himself to a foreign power. The Grand Marshal came in. The Emperor, after continuing the conversation for some time, took him away to play at chess. He suffered much from the badness of the weather. After dinner, he read La Tartuffe. 
but he was so fatigued that he could not get through it. He laid down the book, and after paying a just tribute of eulogy to Molière, he concluded in a manner which we little expected. The whole of the Tartuffe, he remarked, is unquestionably finished with the hand of a master. It is one of the chefs d'oeuvre of an inimitable writer. This piece is, however, marked with such a character that I am not at all surprised. It appears should have been the subject of interesting negotiations at Versailles out of a great deal of hesitation on the part of Louis XIV. If I have a right to be astonished at anything, it is at his allowing it to be performed. It holds out of my mind devotion under such odious colors. A certain scene presents so decisive a situation, so completely indecent, that for my own part, I do not hesitate to say, if the comedy had been written in my time, I would not have allowed it to be represented. The 20th. About 4 o'clock, I attended the emperor according to his orders in the billiard room. The weather still continued dreadful. It did not allow him to set his foot out of doors. And he was, he said, notwithstanding, driven from his apartment and the saloon by the smoke. He found my countenance. He remarked quite cast down. It was with the most lively indignation. And he wished to know the cause of it. Two or three years, I said, have passed since a clerk in the war office, a very worthy man, as far as I know, used to come to my house, give my son lessons in writing and in Latin. He had a daughter whom he wished to make a governess and begged us to recommend her. Should an occasion present itself, Madame Lascaza sent for her. She was charming in every respect, highly attractive. From that moment, Madame Las Casas invited her occasionally to her house with the view of introducing her into the world and obtaining some acquaintances for her who might prove useful. But how strange. This young person or acquaintance, our obliged friend, is actually at this moment the Baroness de S., the wife of one of the commissioners of the Allied Powers who arrived nearly a month since in the island. Your Majesty may judge of my surprise and of all my joy at the singular caprice of fortune I am then about to have... I said to myself, positive particular and even secret information respecting everything that interests me. Several days passed without any communication, but without any anxiety, and even with some satisfaction on my part. For I thought the greater the cautions, the more I had to expect at length, hurried on by my patience. I sent three or four days ago my servant to Madame de S. I had described her very properly, and as an inhabitant of the island, he found no difficulty in gaining admittance. He returned shortly with an answer from Madame de S. Did she not know the person who had sent him? I might, under every circumstance, be still induced to think that this was an excess of prudence and that she was unwilling to place confidence in one unknown to her. But this very day, I received notice from the governor not to attempt to form any secret connection in the island, that I ought to be aware of the danger to which I exposed myself, and that the attempt with which he reproached me was not a matter of doubt for he was put in possession of it by the very person to whom I had addressed myself. Your majesty now knows what has confounded me to find so villainous a charge in a quarter where I had a right to expect some interest in my affairs. Even gratitude has irritated me beyond measure. I'm no longer the same person. The emperor laughed in my face. How little do you know the human heart? What? Your father was your son's tutor, something of that kind. She enjoyed your wife's protection, but she was in want of it. She is become a German baroness. But, my dear Las Casas, you are the person whom she dreads most here, who lay her most under constraint. She did not even see your wife at Paris. And besides, this mischievous Sir Hudson Lowe may have been delighted with giving an odious turn to the thing. He is so artful, so malignant. And he then began again to laugh at me in my anger. After dinner, the emperor resumed his reading of the Tartuffe, which he had not finished yesterday. There was enough left for today. The emperor was quite dejected. The bad weather has a visible effect on him. The 21st. The weather was as horrible as ever. We are seriously incommoded with the wet in our apartments. The rain penetrates everywhere. The governor's secretary brought me a letter from Europe. It communicated a few moments of real happiness. It contained the recollections and good wishes. My dearest friends, I went and read it to the emperor. The emperor suffered seriously from the badness of the weather. He went to his saloon about four o'clock. He thought he had the fever and found himself much depressed. He called for some punch and played a few games of chess with the grand marshal. The doctors arrived from the town. 
the two vessels just arrived came from the Cape. One of them is a Podargus, which left Europe 10 days after the Griffin. The other, a small frigate on her way from India to Europe. There was, it was said, a letter for the Emperor Napoleon, but it was not delivered, and we did not know from whom it came. After dinner, it was said that the medicines in the island were exhausted, and it was remarked that the emperor could not be accused of having contributed to it. This led him to observe that he did not recollect having ever taken any medicine at the Tuileries. He had had three blisters at once, and he had stopped them without taking any. He received a serious wound at Toulon. It was, he said, like that of Ulysses, by which his old nurse knew him again. He had recovered altogether without taking physic. One of us taking the liberty to say, if your majesty had the dysentery tomorrow, would you still reject all kind of medicine? The emperor answered, at present I am tolerably well. I answer yes, without hesitation. But if I got very ill, I should perhaps alter my mind. I should then feel that kind of conversion which is produced on a dying man through the fear of the devil. He again mentioned his incredulity in physic, but he did not think so. He said surgery. He had three times commenced a course of anatomical study, but he had been always interrupted by business and disgust. On a certain occasion and at the end of a long discussion, Corvusart desire of speaking to me with his proofs in hand was so abominable and filthy as to bring a stomach wrapped up in his pocket handkerchief to St. Cloud, and I was instantly compelled at that horrible sight to cast up all I had in mind. The emperor attempted after dinner to read a comedy, but he was so fatigued and suffered so much that he was forced to stop and retire by nine o'clock. He made me follow him, and as he felt no inclination to sleep, he said, Come, my dearest causes, let us see. Let us have a story about your fabric, says your man, and let us endeavor to laugh at it. As if we were listening to A Thousand and One Night's Tales. Very well, sire. There was formerly one of your majesty's chamberlains who had a grand uncle who was very old, very old indeed. And I remember your majesty telling us a story of a heavy German officer who taken prison at the opening of the campaign of Italy complained that a young conceited fellow had been set to command against him who spoiled the profession and made it intolerable. Well, we had precisely as like this among us. It was the old grand uncle who was still dressed nearly in the costume of Louis the Fourteenth. He showed off whatever you said accounts of any extraordinary achievements on the other side of the Rhine. Your bulletins of Ulm and Yana operated upon him like so many revulsions of bile. He was far from admiring you. You also spoiled the profession in his opinion. He had he had frequently said made the campaigns of the Marshal de Saxe, which indeed were prodigies of war and had not been sufficiently appreciated. War was no doubt then in art, but now, he remarked, shrugging up his shoulders, in our time, we carried on war with great decorum. We had our mules, we were followed by our canteens, we had our tents, we lived well. We had even plays performed at headquarters. The armies approached each other, admirable positions were occupied, a battle took place, the siege was occasionally carried on. And afterwards, we went into winter quarters to renew our operations in the spring. That is, he exclaimed with exultation, what might be called making war. But now a whole army disappears before another in a single battle, and a monarchy is overturned, a hundred leagues are run over in ten days, as for sleeping and eating, they are out of the question. Truly, if you call that genius, I am for my own part obliged to acknowledge that I know nothing about it. And accordingly, you set my pity when I hear you call him a great man. The emperor burst into fits of laughter, particularly when the mules and canteens were mentioned. He then added, You were, of course, accustomed to say a great many foolish things about me. Oh, yes, sire, and a vast abundance. Very well, we are alone. Nobody will intrude. Tell me some more of them. A fine gentleman who had formerly been a captain of cavalry and who seemed perfectly satisfied with his own person and accomplishments was introduced to a select society where I was present. I come, he said, from the plain de Savlon. I have just seen our Ostrogoth maneuver. That sire was your majesty. He had two or three regiments, which he threw into confusion upon each other, and they were all lost in some bushes. I would have taken him and all his men prisoners with fifty matras, formerly troopers only, 
a usurped reputation, he exclaimed. Accordingly, Monroe was always of opinion that he would fail at Germany. A war with Germany is toxic. If it takes place, we shall see how he will extricate himself. He will have just done to him. The war took place, and your majesty sent us in a very few days the bulletin of Ulm and that of Austerlitz. Our fine gentleman again made his appearance in the same company. And for the instant, we could not, notwithstanding our malevolence, help crying out all in the same breath, And your fifty masters? Oh, truly, said he, is it possible to comprehend the thing that's been triumphs over every obstacle? Fortune leads him by the hand, and besides, the Austrians are so awkward, such fools. The emperor laughed heartily and wished for some, <laughs> some antidote still more absurd. That would indeed, sire, be very difficult. I recollect, however, an old dowager who, to the day of her death, obstinately refused to give credit to any of your successes in Germany when in Ulm, Austerlitz, and your entrance into Vienna were mentioned in her presence. So you believe all that, said she, shrugging up her shoulders. It's all fabrication. He would have presumed to set foot in Germany. Be assured that he is still behind the Rhine, where he is perishing from fear and sends us those silly stories. You will learn in time that I am not to be imposed upon. And these stories being over, the Empress sent me away saying, What are they doing? What must they say at present? I'm certainly now giving them a fine opportunity. 22nd. This was a day of real mourning for me. It was the first since our departure from France in which I did not see the Emperor. I was the only one in consequence of fortunate circumstances who until now had enjoyed that happiness. His sufferings were great and his seclusion complete. He did not wish to see a single person.